Hello everyone and welcome back to day two of theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit here in the Mile High City, Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host and analyst, Rob Streche. Rob, day two, the energy, we're, st we're still feeling it. We hit up the oxygen bar, we're ready to go. <laughs> we're, we're ready to roll at Red Hot. <laughs> Red Hat Red Summit, that you coined that, that phrase yesterday. I know, I mean, they're going to have to trademark it. Actually, Absolutely. I mean, it's actually warm in here, which is a, a difference from other conferences, but I, I think we're going to keep that heat going because I think we have an excellent guest to really talk about the strategy and the thinking and where Red Hat is going, where it's been, how it gets to the next level. Well, no one better to talk about where it's been and where it's going than Mike Ferris. He is the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at Red Hat. Thank you so much for coming on, for returning to theCUBE. Return, I'm happy to be here again. It's been a great several years. I've been with Red Hat for a long time and this just continues it. We're really excited about the announcements we're making. Well, as a Red Hat veteran, we're going to absolutely get, it, get into yeah. the history. But, there've been, but let's talk about the present. There okay. are so many innovations and exciting product announcements that have happened this week, REL, REL AI, and and Instruct Lab, from your perspective as the Chief Strategy Officer, um, how how do you how do you put these these particular announcements in perspective in terms of Red Hat's overall strategy and Red Hat's overall approach and philosophy? Absolutely, and, and so you know when I think about what we do as a company, you know it's open source and we deliver, deliver platforms, and those are the two founding elements of any move that we make. And, and so when we talk about the platforms aspect here, you know, extending what we've been doing with customers for decades now in enterprise Linux, OpenShift of course, automation with Ansible, into the space of AI really means taking them on a journey from everything they've already employed, all the infrastructure they've spent, uh, all the skills they've been developing on that, and then adding to it. We've done that with Red Hat Enterprise Linux when we added OpenShift to it. Certainly OpenShift AI was an extension to OpenShift itself. And so now as we start talking about moving into the AI space, really taking Red Hat Enterprise Linux, releasing Red Hat RHEL AI as well, really starts to extend that as well. And it really means people can take their investments they've done from the start. Meanwhile, doing all this in the open is still critical to us. It's still 100% of every motivation that we have. Uh, and so it's been an interesting dynamic, you know, as models have matured since I think it was February of 2023, when Meta released their Llama models into the world as open, not necessarily open source, but as open, it started that process and then it just blossomed from there. And so in partnership with IBM Research, being able to say, look, these granite models, which, which you've held back in your proprietary products, let's take them out to market in a much more open way, have the world extend that, but then just as importantly, extend it with a community. And that's what we've really been talking about at Red Hat Summit around Instruct Lab and the ability to take the knowledge and skills just like we've been able to work with the coders and the developers in the space extending Red Hat Enterprise Linux or Fedora and other, other environments there, do so with knowledge and skills toward models and really develop the same type of ecosystem, the same type of evolution of models that has been in, in open source code for a long time. And that's, again, that, that concept of open source and platforms has really been driving us. Yeah, I, I think, again, we we're big believers in open, so you know, we're, we're on board with you. I, I think one of the things that I find interesting is, from a strategy perspective, you, you've seen it from the you know, RHEL release one, right. Enterprise Linux, yep. all the way up to now. And like you said, you kind of, you know, when we were talking leading up to this, you saw it go to cloud, and you've seen it get to where it is. Now, Kubernetes is 10 years old, you know, and, people are looking at how do we get to the next level and build these apps on top of Kubernetes and go to cloud native. And I, I think, are you seeing that the challenges of how you bring AI out and how Instruct Lab with Podman going to RHEL AI, going to OpenShift AI, how people are, you're giving them that kind of pathway to build these applications that are composed of both models and non-model tech yeah. as part of that. I mean, I'll draw some parallels as well, right? So, obviously, virtualization is a hot topic, right? We can get into it or not, but yeah. you know, it's it's a matter of saying, look, 
regardless of whether you have containerized applications or virtualized environments, you want the same platform, the same consistency across this hybrid cloud environment, because you're going to have to make choices on where you get the best resources, how you deploy those. And so the same thing applies to artificial intelligence into this, right? And so we're now talking, and I think Chris Wright, our CTO, has, has spoken very eloquently about, you know, it's going to be 50% applications, 50% model-driven infrastructure in the future, so you want those two things on a similar platform, again, across this hybrid cloud. And as we talk about everything we do, I've got a, a chart that I use fairly often in the company that really has enterprise Linux and Linux at the center of everything we do. And so extending that with OpenShift AI, extending it with RHEL AI and starting to talk about this, it's the same mechanism, right? Giving customers something that they've started with, have been comfortable with, matured you know, their, their new applications into when we talk about virtualization and containers, now we're talking about doing the same thing with AI and it really just extends that model. Yeah. How do you describe the key challenges and obstacles that your customers are facing right now? And, and, and in terms of the, the announcements made this week, how are you addressing those? Yeah, so, so certainly, I mean, I've been dealing with a lot of customers this week so far. Uh, we had, a, had an executive exchange over the past day, which was great. We had about 150 customers in a room together talking about this collectively. And I'll say, things like skills are still top of mind. A little bit different than it was last year, now it's about data scientists and how do we actually mature this. Um, safety, security, trust, these things are all core to the questions that they're asking, both for their existing infrastructure, but also how do we move forward in the AI space. And it's that concept of applying what we've always been doing to this. Things like openness is at the core of what we do, uh, the experience that we have in decades of building enterprise open source products are now also applying to the AI space. But just as importantly, involving customers in what we're doing is critical for this. And so that's why when we talk about the things we do, and specifically I'll go back to Instruct Lab itself, being able to say, well, not only can an open source community contribute and work in this, and we can see what's happening, we can trust what's going in, but you yourself as a customer, when you deal with regulatory issues and data sovereignty and all those things you're going to have to do, you can use those same principles that are maturing in the open source realm inside your enterprise wherever you need to do that. And so our focus is very much to continue that same mechanism that we build the products customers can trust in this because we're part of the whole process, but it's ultimately up to them to understand where we fall and they fall in their governance over what they're doing and how they're managing it. Yeah, so I, I, I think you, you hit on it, and so we'll go there. Okay, all right. <laughs> virtualization all right. and OpenShift vir virtualization. Yeah. We've talked about it a little bit. Uh, obviously, there's some licensing changes going on with VMware and others and stuff like that. How do you see this playing out? Because, I mean, again, when, when, I, when we take a step back from the analysis perspective and look at it, you, you also made some of your own changes with CentOS. We had, yeah. you know, uh, Salesforce saying, hey, we're sticking with Red Hat and here's why we're doing it, which I thought was a fantastic, I think they, they laid out, I, I, you should bottle that up, because what they said in, Chris, in Chris's, uh, or Chris's uh, keynote, Shesh, yeah. Shesh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shesh's keynote was, I, I mean, like on point about yep. that. How do, you, how do you see customers really looking at this? Because you come from an open perspective on this, yes. and the landscape of virtualization, of v, VMs are not going away. They're, they're just not. not. And like the mainframe hasn't gone away. Cobalt's still there, yes, right? Yes, Cobalt is still there. I started out doing Cobalt too, but it's yeah. like when you start, start to look at that, how do you see organizations really rationalizing this from, it, it, the OpenShift virtualization is kind of the, becoming a control plane at that level. So, with, Containers so so let me start with you know, what I think has really happened, and I heard this this morning in a breakfast that I was hosting. Trust has been lost, right? And that is, going back to the foundation of when we started Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it was about trust and choice, right? That's what we built the product on, turned it into a subscription model, we really extended that. And so, uh, when, when another part of my job is heavily on the business models, we talk about subscriptions and different purchasing programs that we'll produce. Um, the guiding principle that we have in that is to make sure that we're transparent in what we do, both on the technology and on the business models, and that it also always puts Red Hat in a position that every single day we have to demonstrate our value to the customers. And if there isn't something that keeps you honest more than that uh, when you're dealing with the customers, because we're always going to put the source code out, we're always going to put, you know, in the open source AI community, we're always going to have the skills and knowledge that are out there and trying to deal with that, it's very transparent from that perspective. 
And so, you know, when I heard this morning that I don't trust this particular partner anymore, yeah. um, you know, you know our, our demand is, look, we're going to continue to do what we always have done. We're going to have the technologies that have matured in the open source community, that we grow into enterprise products, that we deliver that, and we not, may not address every single aspect of every need of every customer, but that's why we're open, because we inject our partners into the environment so that they can actually extend what we do. And so that openness, that demand, and we also end up saying, look, we're going to end up giving you the choice, because we're open source, you don't have to stick with us. You still have the rights to use what you get, you're just not going to get the value of the service that we fight every day to deliver to the customers. And that's really what we're yeah. focused on. I, and I think, I, I think what I've been hearing just talking to other organizations as we get out and, out and about is that they're, when they're looking at it, they're saying, okay, I, I've moved certain VMs over. Yeah. And I mean, Goldman's here talking about it and I, they were at KubeCon, I believe, as yes. well. And we had them on there. I, I think when you look at this, it, is there a sweet spot for OpenShift virtualization where, that you, you see right now from a use case perspective, or is it, hey, come one, come all, and you know, bring every workload? So th this is also something that I want to make sure that we're clear on. Yeah. Um, there will be cases that not everything can move over, yeah. right? So the complexity of these environments vary from customer to customer. We want to be careful about that, and we will be honest with the customers, yeah. and engage the right partners to help in that, and we do. We have a suite of partners that will get there, but for the majority of cases, if you're looking in an environment where, one, you're looking for a way of, frankly, moving these VMs somewhere, and two, in the future, potentially modernizing them, putting them in the containers, go to microservices, go to cloud native environments, we have a consistent single platform in OpenShift that provides that, that OpenShift Vert allows you to have, and it was said in the keynotes, have the VMs run right next to the containers, an amazing opportunity for you to start and then extend going forward. And again, getting back to that fact that this is open source, it's the thing that we're going to continue to fight to show the value. We will iteratively continue to improve this. We had some announcements today about it. All those extra things we're going to put into it, and keep in mind it also positions you for the future because we also have OpenShift AI that is also based on this. And so the next step in that evolution, taking the virtual machine applications, turning them into containers, microservices, breaking them apart, and then extending them with an AI infrastructure that you can actually inject the AI into those applications. We'll get back to that thing that Chris Wright said, you know, 50% applications, 50% AI environments, that's what's really going to drive this, this technology of the future. So one of the big challenges that you had mentioned that customers are dealing with is skills. Yes. And I'm curious to hear how you as a leader is, is also fostering this culture of learning and upskilling in your organization too, because I'm imagining every technology executive is struggling I with mean, this. For everyone in the industry, everyone in this building right now, it is always a challenge, not just for your teams, but for yourself, right? I'll, I'll say over the past year, I have spent more of my own energy investing in understanding the language of artificial intelligence and the concepts to really start understanding not just what we're going to do, but how I get the rest of the company involved in this. And so, uh, you know, for my own team, very specifically, I give them videos. I start saying, this is what we need to learn, this is where we're going as a company, and this is what it's going to mean to our customers, our partners, and the market at large. Um, it also means not just training, but also on your own effort, actually experimenting. I'll tell you, I was on a plane coming to this, and I was looking at some of the other models, not, not granted, but other models, trying to figure out how do they operate, like what are the limitations, what do we need to be concerned with, and I had a, a pretty, pretty big uh, understanding that I hadn't expected on that plane, and all of a sudden I'm going to go back, talk to our teams, and say, I think we need to go down this path, not just with the models, but how they're deployed. And it's that experimentation, which is really at the core of what open source is really about, yeah. that I think is going to continue the evolution here. Yeah, I, I think with AI, there's just no doubt that that's, that, that's a, a good push. And I, I think, again, uh, given that you look at it from a strategy view, and we kind of talked to Chris Wright about this a little bit, was kind of sustainability of AI. Yeah, yeah. And it, you can, being in the position that you are, uh, yeah. Give us your view on what Red Hat's view is on sustainability and how bringing that to not just to AI but infrastructure in general. Yeah, so I won't get into the Kepler project yeah. and kind yeah, of the, yeah. the details there, but you know, I, I think from the perspective of being able to take, especially in the AI case, looking at instead of these monolithic, very large models that are expensive, as Chris said, to build, deploy, run inference against, look at how more efficiently you can operate for specific tasks in an organization. 
it applies both to the AI space, but also the applications. I mean, that's the beauty of yeah. containerization as well, right? So being able to take that down to how do you actually more efficiently use your resources in the places they need to be used with the people for the tasks that they need to be used. And it really is a overall view of how you actually engage the architects, the developers, the infrastructure managers across a whole continuum. And that's why we start talking about platform centricity, right? Being able to say OpenShift, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Ansible, these are the things you center on. Don't worry about how those operate underneath because that's what we're here for. Right, we're going to worry about the chips, we're going to worry about the efficiency of using those, how that actually gets translated into whatever you're doing above them. Before, it was applications sitting on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, now it was containers sitting on OpenShift, now it's going to be models shipped sitting on RHEL AI and OpenShift AI. And it's all that full stack view that you have choice across all of it, of course, but that stack view that allows us to get down to really focusing on where we can drive the efficiency, you know, where we sit, and let customers focus on the application architecture, the AI architecture that they're running to really make it work. Excellent, last question because I know we're running out of time here, but, but because you were almost there at the beginning of Red Hat, yeah. uh, this company founded in 1993, you joined in, in 2000. 2000 yes. I'd, I'd love you to just reflect a little bit on, on the identity and culture of Red Hat as you've seen it and, and as, it's, as, the, as you've progressed in your career and as the company has, so, has progressed. So no doubt, when, when I started, and we have some of the other execs here that were here as well, um, you know, we were a much smaller company. We did not have an enterprise product when I started. Uh, and you know, it's been an amazing journey watching this, of course. We're now about 20,000 people, part of IBM. Uh, and you know, what I will say though, very consistently, is we have stuck to our open source commitment, our roots there, uh, you know, and it's always a challenge to maintain that while being fiscally responsible to stockholders uh, and shareholders, as well as the employees and our customers, because if we didn't exist, then our customers and our partners wouldn't have businesses to operate on. And so we have to make sure that what we do there but it's a really amazing concepts internally that we are open about talking about these things. Very much an open dialogue company, much larger, it's different, it's hard to, hard to have the hallway fights, if you will, that we used to have, but, but it's still very much part of our core culture to really discuss things, engage, but stick to those core roots, as I said, platform centricity and open source are really driving the vast majority of what we do. Wow, Mike Ferris, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE, a great thank conversation. Thank you very much. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Strecce. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit here in Denver. You are watching theCUBE, the leader in tech news and analysis.